There we go. That's better. <laughs> well, now we're live. Hi, everybody. Uh, so today is just sort of an impromptu stream. Um, I was going to do some other things today to kind of set up for tomorrow's D&D stream. I'm going to clean up the map a little bit, the one that we worked on last time in uh, HexDML. And I figured, while I'm doing that, well, there's no reason why I shouldn't just stream that. I'm just going to be doing it anyways. Um, I've also been working on retooling the dungeon creation document that I have. Um, it's almost two years old at this point. So, and I was using it a little bit um, earlier this week. And I was like, oh, things are kind of out of order. I could optimize this a little bit better and make it flow a little bit more. And, you know, incorporate some, some of the lessons I learned creating it almost two years ago at this point. So I figured I'd, I'd do that if I have time. Um... I'm not quite sure how long I'm going to be streaming, so uh, hopefully you're you're here, you know, throw your highs in, uh, we can we chat about other things, I figure we'd do a little, just a little opening chat before we kind of jump into things, um, kind of talk about the, the week and what's going on, so, you know, how's your week been, how are things going, <laughs> uh, my week was alright, overall, um, I guess, you know, played two games of D&D, &D. Uh, one on Thursday and then one last night. Thursday group, always good. Really enjoy that group. Uh, I'm playing in two games. I'm not running anything right now. Um, besides the occasional sort of one shot just to kind of give people time off. But I'm not running any sort of campaigns right now at the moment, which is why I'm kind of doing this solo RPG series. Kind of sort of scratch that itch for myself. But the Thursday game went well. Uh, we're doing uh, the Hidden Shrine of Tomoe Chan, which uh, I have Yawning Portal just kind of up here on my bookshelf. Uh, but I'm purposefully, <laughs> obviously, not reading it because I'm playing in the, the thing once I realized that we were playing. Uh, in that campaign, we the DMs basically go in one, two, three, four, and just kind of running right through the modules that are in there, sort of those classic dungeons. So we're in Tomoe Chan right now. And. Uh, it's doing well. I think we're probably, oh, somewhere between 50% and 75% done. We, well, we may be closer. Because we've killed two of the three big bads. But we haven't gotten to the next level of the dungeon yet. Uh, we're just now entering that. Or the next section of the dungeon, I should say. Uh, so, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, but otherwise pretty, pretty basic playing a sorcerer. Uh, I did sorcerer <laughs> spellcaster d d things, uh, which means I, I essentially sat in the back row and spam spells and, uh, tried to, try to keep, um, my frontliners from dying. Uh, pretty, pretty rough fights, but otherwise, you know, things went well. We're, we're stacked up with gold, so we're... We have to get that back in town, but we have not, however, found much of a lead as far as the curse that is affecting our uh, our group's mascot slash pet, our dog. Um, yeah, so that's what we're trying to find. We, were, we got a lead that there was a rumor that was in there, and that's what we're trying to do. Hey, Gift of Gabby. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, I just talked about my D&D &D games. I had D&D &D games on Thursday and Friday. Uh, so just kind of talking about that. So how are you? What's going on with you? So uh, uh, where was it? Oh, so Friday. The Friday game was a, it was a little bit weird. It was a little bit slower. Uh, we, we basically spent the entire session uh, chasing chickens. Uh, which is, it's it was a nice reprieve. It's definitely uh, lowered the tension. The last couple, two or three sessions have been kind of rough. Um, so it was nice to kind of get out of the city where things were pretty, pretty difficult. Um, we're basically fleeing the city at this point because things did not go well. And uh, just making our way north on the map. And in that time, just kind of doing some, some nice little downtime, some nice little... Slightly less stressful things to take care of, um, but yeah, that's 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 it. Um, so what we're doing today is just 
like I said, we're going to go over, clean up the hex TML map that we were working on for our, for the Sunday streams, uh, for where I'm running the solo RPG, or I'm going to be running the solo RPG. We're still doing the setup right now. And then after that, I have a dungeon creation document that's about two years old that I'm doing some edits on, and uh, we'll get through that. Uh, if that goes well, if people enjoy it, it's one of the things to look at that potentially in the future, maybe we'll use it to make some dungeons or something like that. Maybe I'll put those up for people to download, you know, do something fun like that. Um, let's see, what else is sort of going on this week? Uh, I did watch uh, Sly Flourish had a, had a nice video on YouTube about Static Monster Initiative for D&D. That was really interesting. I've used, I've used Static Monster Initiative. Uh, for probably a couple of years now, and I really enjoy it. Uh, basically, you just, like you would with passive perception, you just add 10 plus the monster's initiative, and then you allow people to basically roll their initiative around that, so that kind of ensures that the monster pretty much never goes last, but also never goes first. Um, and it makes it easier to sort of record initiative, because you just go, okay, my monster's got an initiative of 15 who has higher than 15 initiative and then I can write down the, you know, one to three names of people who have that and then I can just write down the names after that, uh, which makes it a little bit clearer than trying to figure out people's initiative and then trying to put them in the list order, which is really a lot more difficult. It requires a lot more work than it really should. And unfortunately, there's just not a great solution for that yet. Um, other than, you know, anything that's fully automated if you're using sort of like a virtual tabletop or something of that nature. But manually, there's there's not just a faster way to do it. Uh, even sort of like the... You see people that do like the, the card tents that go on top of DM screens. Like that's really not faster in that regard because you still have to figure out the, the order of everything. Um, but that's sort of what's going on there. I've, I've really enjoyed it though. Um, and it does remind me of another style of initiative that I've used kind of with it, which is rather than trying to create a list, instead you you just go around the table with the different people and you just have it set up that way. Actually, let me just draw that out. Got a handy dandy little whiteboard. Make, hopefully this will, the camera can pick this up. It rolls it out. So if you have like, say, you have a DM, and you have, say, like a 15, and then you have player 1, player 2, player 3, player 4. So you just kind of assign it where the table goes, and then you go, oh, this is a 17, and oh, I've got, an, I've got an 8, and I've got a 22, and I've got a 13. So hopefully the camera will pick that up pretty well. Oh, it's a little bit backwards. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, but basically, you set, it, you set it up the way that people are sitting at the table and recording it just going around. Um, because really, the cognitive load for just being able to count where you are in initiative isn't, isn't very much. So it can actually go faster and get you into the action faster than trying to take in everybody's initiative and then trying to set it in a line. Uh, which can take a lot of time where people kind of waiting, which is... One of the things you want to avoid with initiative, right? You want to just kind of jump into the combat. Uh, but I think that's probably enough chatting. Of course, if you guys have questions, throw it in, throw it into the chat. I'm happy to answer it and talk about whatever I want. Uh, whatever you guys want to talk about, you know, we can uh, anything that deals with DM. I've been DMing for oh, um, 15 years ish, uh, so you know I've done quite a bit. Uh, so I have, you know, some experience. I can maybe answer some questions if it's something you're interested in, uh, or if you're interested in, you know, just D and D in general, or playing tabletop RPGs or uh, solo RPGs, which is something that I've really gotten into in in the last probably half a year. I've really sort of enjoyed. Um, so yeah, just just drop those in. I'll answer them as we go. Uh, you know, everything else. Uh, I've got links below. So you know, if you want to see our, my website. I'm, I'm new to streaming, but I've been doing sort of content creation for D&D for a long time. So I've got uh, that website down there has my blog, which has been going on um, longer, long enough to make me feel very old. 
<laughs> but it has a lot of great tips and stuff like that in it if you're looking for things like that. Um, I think at this point, let's just go, let's go ahead and jump over. And I think, uh, yeah, let's let's hop over and look at our map and start cleaning that up. That'll be good. All right, there we go. So this is sort of where we left it um, last week. Last week? No, this week. Uh, almost a week ago, right? Because I, I did this on Sunday. Uh, so basically, we've got. Uh, this probably looks like gobbledygook right now. Um, but so let's let's do some ordering. I'm going to here. This is a little program called uh, HexDML. Uh, it's a free browser-based hex mapping tool. I really enjoy it. You can make uh, local save files and upload it and work on it later. I really like so that's what I did with this one. So I've just uploaded it so I can kind of take a look at it. Over here and edit text. You can put text and secret notes and stuff for hexes, which is really useful for for running games. So I'm just gonna these are the Atlas hexes. I need to know that. Grab it. Pop back over here. Um, so basically, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a nice little border down sort of the side. We'll have our atlas, our region, and our county hexes, and then obviously this is the local hexes, which is the very smallest sort of dialed-in zoom view of the map. Um, just just so you know, so you kind of have an understanding. Each of these sort of hexes here in the middle, each of these is what we consider about a a league. Um, so it's mm, between two and three miles. It's about um, how how much, how much uh, area a person can walk across in, in about an hour. That's sort of our measurement tool there. And so this, this entire section is this section on our, on our next up, you know, level, level higher zoom. Uh, and so these are all sort of nested into each other with this one being all the way down the bottom. Uh, so let's go ahead and that's more here. Okay, so we're just gonna we're gonna take this hex and we're gonna move it over here. Now there's not a very simple copy and paste, unfortunately. So basically, I have to manually do it, but that's okay. Anyone's gonna have to do that. Um, and if I was doing this, you know, if I was doing it uh, by myself, not for a stream, I'd, it wouldn't have been quite as cluttered. But that's okay. We're just gonna go back in and do it real fast. Shouldn't take us too long. So we've got that, we've got that. Um, we've got this guy in the middle. We've got, uh, that's right, we had a volcano. I forgot we rolled up a volcano. These were all randomly generated in the stream trying to figure out where the start of this solo RPG that I'm gonna play on stream, where we're starting out. Where's sort of our starting area, uh, which is a very useful sort of world building tool. And we can kind of go over what each of these, which each of these little things means. Uh, if you guys have any questions about that, just uh, let me know, and I can go over it in more detail. Um, I go, you know, a little fast just because, you know, it's something I'm pretty familiar with at this point. But uh, if you need me to slow down, definitely tell me to. <laughs> I'm not going to be upset by that. <laughs> uh, so we want to push there. So this is our trading post. So this central area right here has a trading post in it, which is sort of our central base of operations for the for the start of the campaign. It's a trading post. It's got a uh, a pretty sizable village. I think it's got a, a village with a thousand people in it. Seven fifty, a thousand, something like that. To be our starting area. So it's a nice starting area. It's right. We're going to be able to do a lot of things there for for a little bit. That's that's the plan, anyways. Uh, so which means these guys will go away. So we can do that, and then we can just go in here, go down here. So we just delete out that text, and now that's gone. And then we can do our next level sort of here. So we'll do that. Uh, and we'll put our our lovely little trees in here. With that, 
So I'm changing the color of the trees because this is what we call, um, what I ended up rolling up was dry forest. So uh, this whole, the whole start of the campaign is going to be in a tropical, subtropical setting. So very hot, very sort of, sort of um, on the edge of what you would, might call sort of like the Serengeti in Africa and the Sahara. So sort of in that area where um, there's a transition between full desert, very, very hot desert uh, through sort of like minimal grasslands into sort of these very dry forests that um, kind of kind of only half the year are almost dead and then half the year are very kind of explode with vibrance. That's not what that needs to be. That needs to be water. Grab our water. Boop. All right. So that's our. So we have uh, basically an oasis that's going to serve as sort of like the beginning area for this. All right, and then we have our little marsh, and then so this uh, long line with the dot. That's right here and here and here. Um, these guys. Uh, these these tiles indicate that that's actually a desert. Um, so it's extremely dry, right? So that's why we have sort of our setup here um, with this area, and this is why we chose this, this sort of area, this area that's in the middle of this hex, is because it's basically an oasis in a particularly dry area. Uh, so it's got a lot, it makes sense that there's a trading post there, that there's a lot of sort of trade traffic that goes through the there that's trying to get in between um, the hills and mountain ranges there and sort of sort of go on their way and sort of skirt around some of the some of the desert areas all right so let's end here and let's say actually I'm gonna move this up here this is our region hex um actually I'm gonna do that for you this as well move that up a little bit Perfect. And then down here, we're going to add, this is our county hex. Perfect. Um, so just to kind of break down sort of the difference between Atlas, region, county, and then local hexes. You said that local hexes are about a league across, so between two to three miles, about as far as a person can travel across in an hour. Um, at the county, that sort of represents. So, I mean, you can, you guys can see that you, this is about five hexes wide. So we have five hexes wide, which means that it is, you know, about five hours. Actually, no, is that correct? No, I'm screwed, screwing up my own system. I think that might actually not be right. Um, I'm not sure the the format of this of these guys right here of this sort of hex space is correct, but um, I I mean other than being I, that's the problem, right? It's on the side. I need to shift it 90 degrees. Okay, we can do that. That's not a problem. Um, let's do that. Just kind of see what that would look like. I'm gonna remember how to do this real quick. Let's just do this with like a background color. Uh, I'm trying to remember the layout of these things. So remember that it's very awkward. I may have to look this up real quick. Actually, uh, let me hop out so that way I can look at and pull that up real quick. And we'll get that. So let me pull that file up because I have a template for this that I just wasn't looking at when I made it initially. So let's fix that real quick.
So basically, and Slaver's Camp was one of those. So Slaver's Camp does this water hex in the county side, but also this guy up here. This county hex. Um, so actually what's, what I ended up doing is that that's not going to actually end up being a dry forest. It's actually going to end up being um, this right here, which is more of a chaparral, which is a more of Mediterranean kind of thing. It's kind of a scrub land. Um, so you've got a lot of sort of uh, shrubs of things of that nature, but not a lot of grass and not a lot of um, particularly large trees. Uh, so if you think about sort of anything that's sort of uh, look at pictures of like the Greek Isles or, you know, the Italian countryside, things of that nature, or uh, the U.S. Southwest in a lot of places or especially over towards, um, if you go all the way over towards Arizona and California, You'll see that. Um, so that's sort of what that's going to be. So that, that just changed one of our hexes, but that's not so bad. Um, and actually, you know, we don't really need to make many other adjustments here. Most of this is fine. Uh, I think I've got enough room to play with outside of this hex if I need to go into it in at least the first session. Well, having to think too much about it. Um... So actually, that was surprisingly easier than I thought it was going to be. I thought this was going to be a little bit more uh, more of a thing, but it's really not, uh, which is great. It means we're, we're set up. I'll be set up uh, for tomorrow and the other Sundays going forward. Uh, so yeah, if you check the, the, the Twitch schedule for myself, uh, you'll see that right now we're set up to do these, these solo RPG posts on Sundays. Uh, so we'll have this going tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be character creation. I'm still trying to figure out whether I want to do a, uh, a zero level character or a first level character. I haven't run a zero level D&D 5e because it requires some sort of homebrew variations. But I came across some that I kind of liked, so I may use those. Um, it may be fun to just kind of do that to kind of trim especially for a solo RPG to kind of showcase the transition between not being an adventurer to being an adventurer. So I think that might be interesting. So I'm leaning towards that, but uh, 
We'll see what happens tomorrow. Uh, it may depend a lot on the stats that I end up rolling. If my stats are not very good, I may decide that I that I need that extra um, class ability and all that, all the good things that come with having an actual class to uh, ensure sort of survivability. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, well, we need to save this guy. So let me do that. Let me save. Let me make sure it actually downloaded. And it did. Perfect. Alright, got it. So we are actually good with this. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is I think I'm going to... Let's, let's jump over to... Uh, the other thing I said we were going to work on was sort of the dungeon creation outline. That's the other thing that I've been kind of tooling around with, so let's let's take a look at that. Let's go ahead and hop over there. All right. Hold on. Just a minute. That's not the right thing. Let's set this up. Let's see our solo RPG notes. So let's... Uh... Hmm. I'm not sure why that stopped pulling up. It's all right. We can we can swap back over to uh, full screen view and look at it that way. There we go. No problem. Alright, so like I said, I've been working on this for a while. Um, so I'm just kind of revising it. You can see kind of over here on the left. You know, it's, it's a pretty in-depth document. I'm trying to make it a little bit easier. This is something that people enjoy. Maybe something I look at uh, updating. Updating, I might put it out on drive through RPG. Um, we'll see. Maybe. Uh, anything, and of course I have other things that are on drive through RPG if you're interested in getting sort of like homebrew supplements, especially for D&D 5e. Uh, so you can check those out. Uh, everything that I make on drive through RPG is pay what you want, so if you need to grab it for free, that's great. Uh, perfect. Go. Use it. Have my blessing. If you like what I'm doing and you want to support the things, you want to show your support, and, and every time that I get support in sort of a monetary sense, Tells me that people want more of that, so if you're interested in that, you can, you know, throw me a dollar, throw me five, ten, however much you want. Uh, that's the whole point. And you can always, and of course, if you download it for free, you can always come back later if you really like it, or you 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 have the money, you didn't have money at the point, or whatever it is. Uh, you can always go back and and pay for it later if if that's something you're interested in doing. Uh, so let's kind of go over it. Let me go just straight down the document so we can kind of look at it. Um, and we'll get to the point where I'm, I'm working at, right? So it kind of talks about immediately, you know, why do we run dungeons? Classic D&D Dungeon Delve represents the best prep to play ratio for dungeon masters. A single dungeon level or zone of a dungeon uh, often takes, you know, players multiple sessions to explore and get through, but it's as, as far as for Dungeon Masters to create that for your own game from scratch, it doesn't take that long. Uh, another good thing about dungeons, especially for new DMs, is that they are finite spaces. You are going to put your players and their characters in a box. So you don't need to worry about when they decide to try to chase butterflies way off into something you haven't prepped. Which is really, really nice, especially for new DMs, when... Maybe your improvisation, you might not know exactly what to do or how to sort of get them back on track without sort of hard railroading them into doing exactly what you've sort of prepped. Uh, but you can do that with dungeons because the dungeons themselves are a finite space that they aren't going to be able to get out of unless they go all the way back through the entrance, right? Um, so what it, what is the, the goal of this document at... Creating a thoughtful dungeon using only your mind uh, is difficult, very tedious, 
This guide provides a skeleton structure to build a rational dungeon environment and provides plenty of random table design tips and flourishes so that way you don't keep making the same dungeon again and again and again. The whole point is to sort of keep things fresh. Sorry, I kind of have a, a little bit of a scratchy throat from started coming on last night. Um, we got a little lemon balm tea that should help a little bit, and I also have some uh, some lozenges. Okay, so also have this sort of italic text down here that talks about um, you know the important part of using anything that's any sort of randomizer, random tables, things of that nature is that you as the human element are the ultimate arbiter of that uh it's supposed to be a tool that helps your creativity not kind of bends you to the will of randomization right of rng uh so it's important that you know you can always choose elements from tables you can always roll if you roll things that you don't like them you just throw them away and roll again or choose something else uh, or if you end up with an idea, it's often better to just go with that idea rather than roll. Like, if you have ideas, use your ideas. Um, if you're running into a problem where you don't have ideas, right, where you're having sort of like DM block, or uh, you feel like you keep doing the same thing over and over again, then that is where the randomization really helps. It really sort of brings things in and kind of shakes up the system. Uh, so here's sort of the document layout. So the first thing we talk about is sort of the background that's set up for the dungeon. So so we understand what the dungeon's supposed to be uh, before we start actually really building it. And then the second section we talk about, you know, the chambers that are going to be in the dungeon, our different rooms, and what's in those rooms. And then the third section talks about mapping and, you know, how do you incorporate all that stuff into one sort of cohesive unit that you can then turn around and put put it on the table for your players. Uh, so let's just jump into the first first uh, section there, dungeon background setup. Right, we're making the background history of the dungeon, what type of dungeon is it, who made the dungeon, Who who's in the dungeon. And that having that sort of background stuff helps to sort of uh, ground the dungeon in your game world. It gives you ideas. It also is very important... Uh, having having a little bit of background of the dungeon helps when your players ask you questions about the dungeon that you hadn't considered before. And when they're like, oh, why are these people doing this? Or what about this? If you have enough of that background information, even if it's just bullet points, it gives you a much better opportunity to create a cohesive answer to that that makes sense uh, for the players and in the world of the game you're running. Which is incredibly helpful. Uh, so then we go on to talk about some, the three different types of dungeons. So there are basically only three types of dungeons. There is a complex, which is any place in which you know, the people who build the dungeon uh, are using it as a home or workplace to do accomplish some sort of task. Uh, that can be anything from a basic camp to a castle to a mine uh, to, to something like a, a sailing ship, right, can be a dungeon, or a shipwreck, right, or a shipwreck. And those would sort of fall in the complex because that would be something that people use to accomplish some sort of task, or they are living at, so oftentimes both, right? Uh, then we have natural structures that's, you know, very, you know, caves, yeah, they could be the, if you want to get weird, it's the interior of giant beasts, it also can, uh, if you want to abstract things, there's a very good angry GM article that talks about everything's a dungeon. Uh, and other people have, have talked about this before. But the idea that if you abstract uh, locations like jungles or forests, you can turn them into sort of basically point crawl dungeons, which can be a lot of fun. I've, I've run a few of those. They're fun. Um, they're really cool. It kind of gives you this sort of lost in a big forest. Uh, I did it with a with sort of a fey glade uh, and forest surrounding it where the party sort of got lost and separated and running through all these different rooms trying to find each other and 
there's a monster chasing them through it, and it's a lot of fun. But usually we think about things like dungeons, jungles, or wastelands, or things like that as sort of like exploration things, or things that aren't interesting. It's something you travel over rather than the location you're going to. But uh, if you set it up as a dungeon, it can be a very fun and fulfilling few sessions as you sort of work through it, it's, as long as you have a goal for a reason for them to be there, even if that goal is just to get out of that place because they're lost. Um, and then the last type is Vault, which actually has two subsections. Uh, so a Vault is just basically a something that you use to secure and store something. It could be a creature, it could be an item, it could be some sort of forbidden knowledge. Um, yeah, so, and it basically comes in two flavors. The first is prison, right? You're basically trying to keep the thing inside the vault from getting out. And then the other one is sort of a haven, right? You're trying to protect the thing that's inside from the outside world. Uh, right? They're basically the same setup. Uh, it's just kind of intentional. You have to think about... Uh, which way um, things are oriented in the dungeon, right? If you have, if you were trying to break into, say, a prison, right? Most of the, most of the way that prisons are set up is to keep things inside the prison, not to keep people necessarily outside the prison. There is that as well, but most of the sort of defenses or security measures are for keeping the people that are inside inside. <laughs> Uh, whereas, you know, if you're doing you know, a reliquary or something like that, or a powerful magic item that you're trying to keep people from taking, right, then most of your defenses and security measures are outside facing, right? They want to keep people out, not necessarily in. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, functionally, they're basically the same. They do the same thing. It's just the perspective of what they do kind of determines, determines the difference. Uh, and yeah, and then I have a, a little note down here talking about that you know, it's not necessarily uh, one dungeon type for the entire dungeon if you're making, a, especially if you're making a larger sort of dungeon, uh, not necessarily a mega dungeon, but definitely a mega dungeon, you look at where there's going to be a bunch of different, there's going to be multiple levels and zones within the dungeon. Right, it makes sense that those zones have their own sort of flavor, and that can include them being different types of dungeons in their own right. Right, uh, the example I have down here uh, is having an underground dwarf settlement that's connected to a natural underground cavern sister, uh, and you'll find that in a lot of adventures, written adventures, you'll find uh, things like dwarven settlements that. Um, there's a wall that's been collapsed or a door that's been sealed up that, like, proceeds into the Underdark. And so getting through the, the like, abandoned Dwarven Hold, Mines of Moria style, is basically your gateway into the Underdark, into a, into a totally kind of different dungeon. But these dungeons are connected and in a lot of ways are basically the same dungeon. Uh, but they're different aspects of the same adventure in that way. Then we talk about sort of the dungeon creator. So who made that, right? If we have a complex or a vault or something like that, somebody has made that, constructed that. So we want to know who the dungeon creators are. And we want to know, you know, why did they do this? What are they doing here? Um, and we can see that. Actually, I need to change this. And delete that. That's a good part of going back through it like this. Of course, if you guys have any questions about the document or about, you know, dungeon creation or anything of that nature, you know, drop it in the chat. Just give me a shout. We can talk about it. Hash it out if you have any questions. Um, right, so we have it basically broken down uh, by the types of creators. So, you know, none or unknown is a little interesting. Uh because you can end up with some, some some interesting combinations, which is one of the things that you use sort of random dice rolls to do, is to help you expand 
expand what you would create beyond sort of your initial gut reaction. So right, if I was making oh an, an, a natural cavern system, well, the natural cavern system doesn't have a creator. Well, no, but uh, but it could also, right? If we wanted that, let's say, if we wanted a, a cave system that was created by something, maybe it's created by. I mean, there's there's all sorts of creatures that burrow in D and D, right? It could be a purple worm that does something like that. It could be any any sort of um, underground monster. A lot of them have burrowing or digging or things like that, or just delete. Uh, what is it? The what's the name of that creature? Zort? Z Zert? I don't know. There's a there's a weird aberration monster that uh, basically kind of just deletes ground as it goes through it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you could you could very much end up with a the cave system in that way um, or I think the example that I, that I use somewhere in here is having like a uh, oh yeah I have a, a jungle created by a dryad or a druid right so it's not a natural jungle or forest right it's created by somebody uh, or or a warden created by thyra rabbits by big rabbits <laughs> which is another fun one Uh, and yeah, sometimes the, the creator is not necessarily the creator, like if we wanted to go with the cave system thing. It may just be that they're the first occupant, so they have taken whatever whatever was there and tuned it um, to their own needs. So I kind of think about that as sort of like, right, that's got a very caveman kind of feel to it or something like that, right? When you take a natural environment and you sort of bend it to your to to your needs rather than construct your own sort of uh, environment. It's very easy. Then we have our very simple sort of dungeon creator questions, things that we want to know about either the original creators or the original inhabitants of this area. No, who are they? Right, we talked about like the the druid creating creating a forest but is it one druid is it an entire druid circle is it is this something that like all druids in the world know about they know about this one special place like some sort of conclave thing is it like a home base for an order of um druids things of that nature uh yeah what, what are they doing here that's the second question you know why did they choose this location to do this right so if you're thinking about, oh, you know, these, maybe these dwarves have built a settlement in the middle of a desert. Well, why would they do that? Why would they choose to build a settlement in the middle of a desert? Right. It's probably not a lot of natural resources, but maybe there are. Maybe there is something that specifically they can only do there. Uh, right. Maybe they have a, a very very stellar like glass works operation or something and they need just a, a ton of sand and that's the best sand that they can find and so that's where they set it up even though uh, basically need have to import all their basic needs from somewhere else so you know just thinking about that so when people when your players have questions like huh i wonder i wonder why these people did this here and then you can sort of like give them sort of breadcrumb clues so they can sort of figure it out on their own um and you'll be able to answer things for them it also tells you you know how to reference that within the dungeon dressing itself like what the chambers do what's in them you know what what were people doing in it Yeah, and, and number three, how did they build or co-op the environment to their purpose? So it kind of talks about how have they changed things here. So if we look at that dwarf uh, desert complex example, what are they using to build, you know, the places where they're living and working? At? Are they, you know, are they making some sort of like, uh, I 
guess they might have to make like a ram d'oeuvre or something like that. Maybe one of the things. Uh, if it's a glass making thing, are they making sort of like geodesic domes with glass panes? That would be really weird and interesting. Um, yeah. Or maybe it's a bunch of underground stuff, right? But then how do you deal with sandstorms and stuff like that? Those sort of questions that uh, help you sort of flush out the dungeons are re really useful. And then, uh, right, if you're unclear on the creator's purpose, we have a nice 1d8 uh, roll table down there. Um, so you can use this in addition to just choosing a dungeon type, or instead of choosing a dungeon type, um, if you're like, okay, well, my my party's traveling through, uh, let's say, a swamp, and I want to put a dungeon there, something that's kind of a, a short dungeon in between, just as an activity between where they were going and then on their way to their next adventure just sort of a one or two session thing just for them to decide to check out i'd be like okay well uh you know, who are the creators okay well, what the heck are they doing here well i don't know because i'm just kind of making this up <laughs> and then you might go oh uh it's here i you roll something you say oh i rolled a three it's a temple so they've got this weird swamp temple um you know, maybe it's lizard folk or uh, let's say Kuatoa or Bullywogs or something like that, or maybe it's humans, some some other sort of civilized humanoid rather than a, a straight up monster. Um, I mean, honestly, I just talked about at the beginning of the stream doing at the Shrine of Tomoachan. You could literally drop the Shrine of Tomoachan in there. In there, uh, but you'd probably be there for longer than two sessions. <laughs> so, um, if you're, you would probably want to make something custom for that, or use a one-page dungeon rather than Tomochan, because it's a it's a larger dungeon and it'll take take the party some time to get through. Which may not be what you want to do if you're just kind of giving them a side quest in between uh, one adventure and your next planned adventure, right? You you probably don't want a big dungeon delve in the middle of that or they then your players will start forgetting like wait where are we going why are we in the swamp again where are we trying to get to why <laughs> and that's right you don't want your players to forget what the heck you're doing in the campaign <laughs> so that's really helpful to, to to keep those sorts of side adventures very short very to the point um so in addition to sort of the creators of the dungeon most dungeons especially older or like OSR old school dungeons have multiple inhabitants in the dungeon meaning that there are often multiple factions that are kind of in a space and they have some sort of relationship and that may be a that may be a conflict relationship or they may have some sort of basic understanding with each other but they're not a cohesive uh, they're not one cohesive faction so you have different different things going on So yeah, um, yeah, right. The creators may not be in the dungeon at all. I mean, a ton of D and D dungeons have have a dungeon locations and adventure locations that are created by people who are no longer there. Right, and monsters or something have moved in. Right, extremely common. Actually, more common than the dungeon creators being there most of the time. Uh, almost, almost all. I shouldn't say almost all, but a very high percentage, I would say probably the majority of dungeons do not have the original creators represented as inhabitants. Which is good and bad. Right, it's whatever you want to do. Uh, so I like to say that, you know, 1d3, so 1, 2, or 3 factions uh, per dungeon. I think any more than that... If you start getting into sort of a Caves of Chaos territory, you're like, okay, why are these like eight different groups living elbow to elbow in this one location? Uh, right, it's a classic module. It's fun. I, I haven't run it, but I've played it. But it is kind of hard to parse, difficult to parse why all these monsters who do not get along are living right next to each other. 
And then, you know, your players are probably going to ask you, I know I did as a player, why are these people living together? Why are all these creatures living together that don't like each other? And your DM's kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> I got no clue. I have no idea why these people are living together. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the things that we want to avoid, right? We definitely want to avoid that. Uh, so then we have our, our 1d20 dungeon inhabitants. Um, and each inhabitant that shows up in a dungeon has their own purpose, right? Their own reason for being in the dungeon. Right, let's say if we wanted... Actually, you know what? I've got, I've got some dice here. Let's, let's get some dice up. I don't know. They ch Google changed something. They used to, whenever you search directly for it, it would roll that specific dice. And they changed something in how this little tiny web app works. And now it doesn't work like that anymore, which is a little bit frustrating. Uh, so let's say that we have our creator and they need a purpose. Okay, so three, no, three and three. That makes it easy. All right, so uh, no, some sort of elemental, interesting. Uh, I can count. <laughs> I've been counting my whole life. Some sort of dragon. And, uh, and a temple. So it could be a dragon that's made a temple. Or a dragon, or a temple to a dragon. Which, you know, arguably makes more sense. Uh, it's got a very kobold sort of feel to it. So if we wanted to do that. We could go in that direction, right? Don't necessarily have to be... Um, just like with, like I said earlier, we do not have to follow it directly, right? We do not have to follow our random roles uh, if they don't make sense or we have an idea that would make more sense. We should probably use that. So that's what we would do here. Um, and then we have... Let's reroll that and say we had inhabitants. Uh, 17 and 4, which I believe 17 is the creators. Let's see. Yeah, so anything 15 plus uh, are the are the dungeon creators themselves. So that's, that's one of our factions. Uh, but they also have a slightly different thing here. So, anytime that you come up with multiple dungeon creators in there, uh, you know, you might have some sort of schism. You might have some sort of different faction, like a rogue faction within. So, if you have kobolds and most of them, you know, are using this, this adventure location as a temple to a dragon. But uh, maybe there's this other section of kobolds that aren't necessarily... That's not necessarily their purpose at the location. Uh, maybe they're doing... They could do production stuff. You know, maybe they're using, like, discarded dragon scales to make something. Uh, or maybe they found a different section of the this swamp dungeon. Let's say it was in the swamp dungeon where they can do some resource gathering. Maybe they... Maybe they have some... Uh, very valuable healing herbs or something like that that they're sort of mining for this place. And so those factions can be sort of in conflict sometimes. If you have a faction, let's go, if we went with that first idea, you have a faction of kobolds that are sneaking in and stealing discarded scales from, you know, the, the other kobolds' god, right, that they're worshipping, uh, probably not going to be happy about that. So that immediately gives us some conflict in the dungeon. And that gives us a, a space for our players to step into with their characters and be like, oh, I can, I can pit these factions against each other. I can make deals with these factions. They, they might actually hire us or give us a reward for, you know, wiping out the other faction or doing something. Right. Okay. It, it, it's very interesting. And that's one, one of the reasons that we, want to include multiple factions in a lot of dungeons is because if we have two or three factions that have some sort of tension between them 
uh, it gives it gives a lot more opportunities, a lot more creative opportunities for the player characters to feel like they can make an immediate. First, it, it makes the dungeon feel like it's living and things are going on, uh, and we're already going on, and they're going to continue to go on uh, if the players player characters show up and then leave, right? All that stuff's still going to happen. It was already happening. It's going to continue to happen. Uh, but also, it gives them the opportunity to feel like they can make a massive difference in the dungeon and, and how it works, right? If you wipe out an entire faction and then the other faction is friendly to you, now what? Do you then turn around and try to kill that faction who is your, your ally? Um, do you try to negotiate for treasure? Do you, like, there's a bunch of weird and interesting stuff you can do with that rather than you know uh i think ivy especially has sort of a baseline idea in most adventures that like you kick in you kick in the the door of the dungeon and you just kill everything that moves it's not your party right whereas this this sort of setup it kind of tries to get you away from that to be like and old school dungeons are a lot like this where it's like it gives you an opportunity to do something other than kill things, right? You can talk to people, um, you can negotiate on things, you can you can pick up an adventure quest while you're in the dungeon, right? And their own, their own sort of weird self-contained um, quests. Or they, you know, if it was like the kobolds, if the kobolds are manufacturing this dragon scale stuff, well, maybe the party buys it. Maybe that's something they want. Or the kobolds negotiate... Um, for the player characters to go sell their goods in town because, you know, the nearby town, obviously, if you're going to freak out if kobolds show up. Um, but if the adventurers go back and sell off, you know, these dragon's scale items, people are, will buy them from them. And then, you know, it, it's up to your party to <laughs> decide whether they just keep all the profits or they go back <laughs> and talk to them about it. But yeah, so that's sort of our our dungeon inhabitants for the most part. And why we set it up. Uh, yeah, I talked down down here. Uh, another important part about factions is that they're not necessarily uh, monolithic. So if we have, uh, I think I used Dwergar. Yeah. So if we if we have a Dwergar faction in in our dungeon that could include Dwergar as well as Darrow, Steeders, Dwergar constructs, and maybe they have Grimlock slaves. And all of those, so that really means that, like, when you're building your encounters, you don't have to be like, ah, I guess it's uh, another four Dwergar that the party will fight in this room. You can be like, no, there's, like, slaves and constructs, and they have these giant spiders that. That are allied to them, right? That serve as both um, pets and beasts of burden and guards. You know, you you want to include the allies and tools and other things uh, to give yourself both as a DM some diversity in the encounters that you build, uh, and also right that creates interest for each faction and can give you the opportunity to. Your players might try to turn uh, one of those one of those sections against sort of the the faction itself. So if they w were like, "Oh, we'll we'll free the Grimlock slaves," right? Now that's a, a new thing they can do, and maybe the Grimlocks will fight with them. Maybe they won't. Uh, maybe the Grimlocks uh, are are so indoctrinated and so fearful of you know our under dark dwarves that they're like, nope, I'm just going to kill you anyways. Um, but you can figure that out during play rather than rather than assigning that beforehand. Uh, so, like we talked about, like most, most dungeons actually don't have, especially published dungeons, don't have the dungeon creators present. So we might want to know what happened to them. <laughs> right? Where, what happened to them? Where did they get? Why are they not here? Uh, and that, again, like we talked about, sort of leaving those breadcrumbs about things. This helps you do that. And so I have sort of a, a 1d8 table that was set up here. Um, 
right, smote by a godlike entity, so they they pissed off some sort of very powerful being. And you wanna you wanna have that reflected in the dungeon itself. In and it's a very much a show don't tell kind of thing, right? So if they were smoked by godlike entities, you might have um you might have a room that's got a whole bunch of whole bunch of skeletons or dead bodies that are very sort of like in supplication maybe they're kowtowing or something like that on the ground and they're just like like in line and they're all just dead <laughs> you're like what the heck happened here and maybe like you can tell like doing a medicine check or something that they were sort of smote by lightning bolts or something like that <laughs> like what the heck did this uh, so you can kind of leave those breadcrumbs like that for your players to sort of unravel and if you have if you have a storyteller or exploration focused player which is typically the type of player I am like I love that stuff they're going to really like that stuff if you give them sort of a, these breadcrumbs of a mystery that's, that they can figure out it may not actually be important right if the if this godlike entity has smote the original dungeon creators they're, it's, they're not representing the dungeon anymore but they can find out more about like what happened there and maybe they can find out about the godlike entity maybe that leads off to its own sort of like adventure thread that you can pull the string on and follow because one of the things you want to do as a dm is kind of throw these things out there and see you know right you throw out the you, you throw out the adventure hooks you go fishing right and you see which ones the players buy on and when they buy it, you reel them in And having a vengeful ancient god is a really good one. <laughs> Especially if it's something that's not um, in the understood pantheon of the world, it's something else. Because, right, it's a god-like entity, so it might not actually be a god. But it's powerful like a god. So it could be like a warlock patron or something like that, which could be a lot of fun. Alright, uh, so one of the last things that we want to do sort of in doing the background so we it's given us a lot of background about what goes into the dungeon right so one of the things we want to do after that is kind of talk about the condition of the dungeon uh, and basically this sets us up to understand whether there are a lot of tricks or traps in the dungeons or there are a lot of hazards and obstacles in the dungeon and you kind of see you can see down here kind of what that roll table looks like the idea is that if it's in pristine condition, so it's being kept up, so there aren't there aren't any sort of like ceilings that are caved in or tunnels tunnels that have fallen in or you know rotted through wooden stairs or things of that nature, which you know hazards and obstacles, chasms that have opened up in the middle of chambers. We don't have any of that. Uh, but instead, what we're going to have is we're going to have a bunch of traps, right? Tricks and traps that are in perfect that are in perfect working condition so that's what they'll deal with so that just kind of shows us here um, and so in something like good where it's a four to one ratio that means for every four tricks or traps you have you have a hazard or obstacle so it's most it's mostly in good condition but uh, there are a few spaces where you know traversal can be an issue uh, and it's not a directed trick or trap to hurt someone it's just part of the dungeon environment itself and then I like number six down here and that's uneven wear where you can have especially if you have multiple if you're setting up a dungeon that has multiple levels or zones where you can have those rolled individually where it's like oh well uh, this was a massive complex but then you can see whether maybe the creators left or reduced in number and so they only took care of like this one specific little section of the dungeon itself and maybe that's in pristine condition but maybe the rest of it's in heavy disrepair or ruin uh, which which is really nice because it shows you it shows you change as you for your players as they move through the zones uh, it makes it makes things very very clear about the sort of threats that they're going to be facing, right? 
which is very helpful if you can forecast that sort of things for your players so they're not totally caught up guard it assuming they're paying attention right it, it all comes down to are the players paying attention at the end of the day so hopefully they are uh yeah and down here in the in the little flavor paragraph talk about <clears throat> excuse me talk about how obstacles and hazards can include uh, decayed or unstable tricks or traps, right? Up in there, they think, think of them like an unexploded bomb, right? In some ways, that is significantly more dangerous than just a normal bomb. Uh, because you don't know if it's going to go off or what will set it off. Or if it's going to even work correctly. Um, which can be a fun thing to throw at players if you throw them a trap that doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Uh, I was running a dungeon, uh, as an example, that was a, a dwarven hold, very standard sort of dwarven hold, and a mountainside. Uh, and they they walk through the front doors into basically this great feasting hall, which is sort of the entranceway. Uh, and as they step into, there's a big mosaic that's in the front that has like in dwarven, like, like welcome friend, or I can't remember what it says, something like that. And as you step on the mosaic, it... There's a click, because it's got a section. And it's not a trap, necessarily. It's actually... Uh, what it's supposed to do is... Remove... Remove... Um, the people who are coming into the hold. It's supposed to remove their armor and gear and outer layers. Take their coats and hats and, and, and put them away. And then it's supposed to prepare the feasting hall with, you know... With uh, silverware and platters and cups and drinking vessels and all that things. To make them feel warm and invited and right the the torches on the side sort of flare up and light up like that's what it's supposed to do but what actually ends up happening is that that spell is so old that it doesn't work quite right <laughs> uh so it it starts it rips it rips all the armor and weapons <laughs> off off the characters as they step in right and flies them up to a covered um, that's off the ground because the whole point is to put these put these gear and weapons away uh, at a spot where they can't be easily tampered with or stolen from so that's actually kind of significantly off the ground for anybody to reach if they're just standing up on foot uh, so they just kind of like ripped <laughs> their clothes and things off of them not, not all the way down to new but definitely like ripped heavy armor off of people and stuff uh, and flew it up into this cupboard. Meanwhile, the 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 thing that's supposed to set the the part of the spell that sets the tables and things like that is completely on the fritz. And uh, there's there's a little obstacle course that they had to run through. As you know, you have plates flying across the room and <laughs> platters and jugs and cups and stuff bouncing off of people's heads as they're flying around in sort of this maelstrom. It's got a very much a Fantasia Sorcerer's Apprentice kind of feel to it, where magic's just kind of out of control, not doing the thing it's supposed to be doing. Um, it's it's very silly, uh, but it was a fun encounter, and it sort of introduced them to the dungeon uh, and let them know that you know things are this this place has not been kept up, and there are sort of magical and me mechanical things that are within the dungeon. And they may or may not be working correctly. Uh, so anytime that you push a button or flip a switch, uh, it's, it's a roll of the dice. It may or may not work. So you should think very hard about whether you want to use that or not. Uh, so go down to completing the dungeon setup. It kind of talks talks about what we've, what we've covered already. Uh, let's see if there's anything. Right, we talked about show, don't tell again, about making sure to incorporate these elements into the dungeon as you're actually putting, as you're actually designing it and putting it together. Uh, makes makes the dungeon feel livable, lived in, and begin to think about how to get your adventuring party into the dungeon and why. Right, and that that's sort of where we end this section with these sort of dungeon setup questions, where we ask, you know, you. Know, all right, going back to the dwarves in in the desert, you know, what do they need to survive? 
Well, they're going to have to import a bunch of stuff. They're going to have to get water somewhere. Um, they're going to have to bring in food. They might have to bring in building materials. Right? Because you're living in the middle of a desert. So you're, you, the amount of natural resources at your... Um, at your grasp to use is, is very, very limited. And then, uh, what do they need to thrive? So the difference being, like, if you think about whether the... It's to help you think about whether the people in the dungeon are subsisting or if they are thriving, right? Because that can make a big difference. If you have, say, uh, a dwarven mine or something that's taken over by hobgoblins... And they are, they've got a full forge, they've taken over the forge, they are, like, making, they are mining metal and smelting, smelting ore, and they are making new weapons and armors, and they are gearing up um, to be more aggressive, to, to bring more people into the ranks, to go out raiding and be more successful, right? That's definitely a sign of them thriving in the dungeon, which is very different than, um, you know, people who are there just because it's a safe place, or maybe they're kind of transient, maybe they're sort of in between places. Maybe this is not a permanent home for them yet, or will ever be. Um, talk about who or what will serve as the quest giver, right? Most quest givers, right, you have a little exclamation point above their head. Oh, I need you to go into this dungeon and get me X, or... These people were captured from our village. Will you go get them? Something like that. But uh, what things can also serve as quest givers? Uh, if you find a dead body off to the side of the road, right? And that that serves to sort of lead you following the tracks back to this dungeon, then that has done its job, right? It got the adventurers to the dungeon. They're probably going to check it out. Uh, just basically because they're probably looking for loot and XP. Right, and that shows you what problem the dungeon is causing. If you come across a, a dead body with, a, you know, a half a dozen arrows in the back, okay, well, if it's next to a road, that's a problem. You know what the dungeon, what the problem the dungeon is causing is. They're attacking people along this road. So, another question you want to maybe ask is... I know players sometimes ask this, myself as a player and players to me, is why hasn't anybody done anything about this yet? Right? We Because we often set up like cities or things when we're doing world building, and these people also often have like a contingent of guards or things like that, and you're like, okay, why didn't they just go grab like two dozen guards and like wipe this dungeon out? So you're going to want to have an an idea of an answer for that if your players ask you for it. Uh, then maybe, like, if we were dealing with a small village, well, they don't actually have, like, a contingent of guards. So, uh, they're just kind of scrounging together what they can to sort of pay adventurers that pass through to maybe take care of this. Which is... gives you more of a sort of, like, Witcher... the Witcher video games kind of feel... Where you look at people that are trying to, oh, we got attacked by a monster, so of course, we hire a monster hunter. <laughs> and then, you know, think about what, what the quest rewards for that will be. Especially, so if you have a... You'll definitely need this if you have a person who is a quest giver. Right? Because... Very, very rarely do D and D adventurers just go adventuring because they go into life and death situations just because they're good guys, right? Most of the time, they want to get paid. They want to get paid either in money or access to something or some sort of service, something they can't do or don't have access to is what they want in payment. Uh, you can do this also with what so if we did the dead body thing maybe the dead body has a, a note about um a secret cache that's of treasure that's buried somewhere nearby and so that's why they were out here all alone and that's why they got peppered with arrows or maybe they have a friend that's run off so you can, the party can go talk to that friend and see if the friend will tell them any information about it and so it gives you things like that 
And then, obviously, the, the reward for doing that quest would probably be the treasure. Because um, it's unlikely they're going to give that treasure... If there was a, a survivor, right, then it's unlikely that the party's going to give that treasure back to the survivor. Though, you know, I say that, but every once in a while you will get um, a party that'll do that, or they'll have a very strong moral character that will demand that they give that person at least something. Right. Um, but after after we finish it, and so that's all sort of the first section, we move into the second section where we talk about dungeon chambers and stocking them. Right. As the first line says, this section represents the meat and potatoes and dungeon building process. <laughs> so we're going to determine chambers, their purpose, their contents, their uh, DC, and any dressing that kind of goes in with them. Like, just sort of nice little flourishes for our dungeon chambers. Uh, so we talked... I wanted to talk about the, the fiber and dungeon design. It's a really great design, if especially if you are new to do DMing or you only want to run um, a one session a simple one session dungeon like a five room dungeon is a really great design because it's almost guaranteed that the that the party's going to get through that entire dungeon in one setting uh, because there's only five rooms and there's only five challenges and each of those challenges is different uh, so it helps to make sure that everybody every player gets Different player types get what they want out of a, out of a play session. Very useful because you have um, a guardian, something that's keeping people out of the dungeon. You have a combat encounter. You have the red herring or the resource used. You have the exploration or or social challenge, um, or you have the exploration, the unkillable challenge, which can be an exploration or a social challenge, and then you have uh, your reward. Or turn. So, really fast way to set up a dungeon. Really great. Uh, I've used them before. I've made them. I've run them. I've played in them. They're fun. They're great. Uh, the only problem I have with five room dungeons is that if you keep using them, they it the formula gets real stale real quick because there's only five different types of challenges and there's only five rooms in the dungeon. So if you are a player that is familiar with that formula, either because you've read up on Five Room Dungeons or you've just been through them enough, then you start to understand the formula and you, you can very highly predict what's coming up, which is not what we want in a dungeon, right? Especially if it's supposed to represent very, very different things. So instead, uh, kind of to serve as a guide for how to use this document a little bit, I put down here a creating a simple dungeon, uh, which the way that this is set up will probably create a larger dungeon, a five room dungeon. Actually, it's almost guaranteed to, um, because just by combat encounters alone, there should be seven to get you to um, this highlighted boss monster. Uh, so yeah, so that's what we're doing. Um, so that's probably gonna give you more than, uh, five, I think, rooms, unless you're gonna have multiple combat in the same room, which you could do. There are, there are ways to do that, or multiple challenges in the same room. That's, that's definitely something you could do. Oh, thanks, Gabby. Hi, how are you? You doing well? Glad to see you back. Uh, I'm doing, I'm doing great. Oh, yeah, the roll 20s dynamic lighting. Um, I know I haven't used the dynamic lighting myself. Uh, I have some friends that that know it, uh, but I know that it is a very difficult process to get into. Uh, basically, what I run now, and most of the things I've run have been in person, so I haven't need to use a virtual tabletop. Uh, but even when I do, I tend to use this. A simpler solution because especially with fifth edition D&D I find that the theater of the mind combat runs really well so I don't necessarily need it uh, need to take the time to throw things on a VTT but 
um, I do know that dynamic lighting takes takes a bit because uh, you have to set up all the points for that to work. Uh, so good luck to you. And unfortunately, I don't have a resource off the top of my head to as sort of like a tutorial to show show for you. But um, yeah, if if you find a really good one, yeah, share it with me. That'd be great. And then I'll save it or, or make sure other people can see it, which would be really useful. Uh, because I know I know it's a big pain in the butt. <laughs> Uh, so in our in our simple dungeon, so we want seven total creature encounters, and I, I'm using monster and creature sort of interchangeably, just because just because there are creatures doesn't mean necessarily that it has to be a combat encounter, right? One of the things that we're setting up with the factions is the ability to sort of like talk to people and or sneak around them or do something that's not necessarily not necessarily combat. Even sort of the big boss monster doesn't necessarily mean that we have to do a combat to accomplish that. It could be a negotiation, right? That could be the, the end challenge for our dungeon. Uh, based on the way that your your group plays. Uh, but so that's just sort of the, the simple dungeon creations. Like you keep making chambers until, and stocking those chambers until you get seven total creature encounters, which will get you through a boss monster, basically the end uh so with that in mind you know if you're if you're not necessarily looking for a super simple super simple dungeon but you do want to start to consider you know how big a dungeon should you should i make uh which is a lot of things that i feel like a lot of dungeon creation systems don't talk about they, t they give you a lot of tools to make the dungeon, but they don't tell you how to think about how much time you want to spend at the dungeon. Which is very useful for when you're making a dungeon, because you can make a dungeon that's way, way too big, or way, way too small, uh, depending on your needs. And of course, so I'm just kind of rattling through this document, so if you guys have any questions specifically about what's going on here, or other things in general, like the, like the dynamic lighting for D20, um, or Roll20. Uh, just let me know, and we can talk it out, hash it out. So, one of the rules of thumb that I use down here is about four and a half rooms, or four and a half encounters, serves as a, as a pretty good approximation for about how much stuff the average D&D group will get through in three to four hour gaming session. About every 45 minutes, uh, a group gets through an encounter or a scene, or, or a dungeon chamber in this in this side um and i talk about like if you want to do a one shot right and you're going to have these at least seven creature encounters and probably some other encounters and chambers you want to make you probably want to make those encounters easier than you might normally and you might want to err on the side of making the dungeon pretty linear uh so there's not like a lot of roundabouts and backtracking and things like that um just because you want to make sure that you're getting through it in one session uh, another good measurement that I find very useful for making dungeons for 5th edition is um, their sort of design intent as far as how fast people are supposed to level. Um, so the way that it's set up is about every four sessions is what they expect. Um, it, it, four sessions of play, you should be level, leveling up. Um, so that's, if we break that down, that four and a half rooms per session... That's about 18 dungeon chambers. So if you're like, oh, I want them to level up at the end of this specific dungeon. Now, if you want to, you can go in and do the XP dungeon for all your monsters, do all that stuff. I don't like to do that stuff. Um, I think it's tedious. I don't think it necessarily represents the game very well because most XP in D&D, at least the rules as written, is monsters. So, what do you do if you have a puzzle? How do you make XP for the puzzle? Because, and, you know, 5e e, DMG is kind of like, I don't know, figure it out, I guess. So, if I know that I want, if I want the, the players to level up their characters at the end of the dungeon, then that's about how many dungeons, or how many chambers I should put in the dungeon to make that happen and make it feel right. You say it should take about four sessions. And it should take about 
18 chambers. And vice versa, if you don't want them to level up, then you probably shouldn't make a dungeon that's that long. Or else they're going to feel like they should level up by the end of it. Next section, we talk a little bit about mega dungeons. Uh, talk about, you know, how helpful it is to sort of break big dungeons down into the sort of different levels or zones that we talked about. So if you think about uh, a level or zone being sort of its own consolidated dungeon and these dungeons are just sort of lego bricked to each other uh right down here as i say uh, if you want a really good example of that in use is definitely look up metroidvania style video games uh because they all pretty much do that or they all have different sections and each of those sections tend to have individual or very specific challenges and enemies in it uh again if we if we went back and did the if you ended up using the different types of dungeon conditions right maybe this one's very pristine this other one's really run down and the monsters in there kind of reflect that and the challenges reflect that which is really nice so my my recommendation is to keep any sort of zone itself at a max of about 12 chambers uh, a good way to do that is that if you just want to roll 2d6 and just kind of use that's going to give you an average of about seven chambers per zone which is pretty nice um, but it's nice to another good thing about making very very strong zones or levels uh, flavor wise if you do that it makes it much easier for the players to remember where they are in the in the dungeon especially the dungeon's composition overall and they're like oh yeah well let's say we were in we were in the underdark natural cavern system so that's definitely below the dwarf hold um but should be close to you know maybe a cave entrance or something that might lead to the surface or something like that so it gives them the ability to have a better better track where they are in the dungeon and the layout of the dungeon itself if you have very distinct zones and then we get down into sort of the dungeon chambers itself uh, so I like to break them down into very sort of generic types and then if there are if you end up with duplicates on the list while you're making chambers then you can split those down into into very specific sort of things uh, so let's say if you let me let's say uh, food area. So if you have food area and you end up rolling like three food areas, you can be like, okay, well one of those food areas is a kitchen, and the other one's um, a pantry, and the other one is maybe some sort of storage. Maybe whether that's for linens and platters and plates and that things or maybe it's just uh it could be sort of like a root cellar or something like that to keep things cool so just kind of like breaking those down into into smaller pieces of an overall whole if you do that that helps to make you that can lead into how you set up your zones or levels right because that food area could be with three rooms it could be a zone of its own you may or may not want to do that. It kind of depends on how you want to split up your factions, where you want to put things. But the options are there, and that's why that's why this one d twenty roll table is very it's very generic because it's meant to be broken down. Uh, and then it goes on to so once you figure out you know you have an idea of how many dungeon chambers you want, and so in addition to that you. You have the breakdowns for what the purpose of those rooms are. And then I like to do... This is something that I stole from Runehammer and Index Card RPG. Uh, if you haven't played it it's, or taken a look at it, it's really great. It has a really fantastic DM section, so it's really good, especially for new DM. It talks about um, how to run games and how to set up adventures. And it, I feel like it does an exceptionally better job of that than the 5th edition Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, I don't like the DMG because it starts with, hey, create a multiverse or a universe. 
It's like, that's not helpful for a brand new DM. They want to know, like, how do I make an encounter? How do I run an adventure? <laughs> Those are the sort of things they want to know. They don't want to, they don't need to be thinking about like, oh, well, to, to do those things, to run and to create an encounter, to run an adventure, you must first create the universe in which that adventure happens. You don't need to do that. That's not very good advice. Uh, but one of the things I've, I stole from Runehammer and ICRPG, um, from Hanker and Inferno, is the idea of room DCs. See, the idea is that you set a flat DC for the entire room, for basically the entire scene uh, that represents the, the target number for doing anything in that room. Like, uh, I have down here, uh, do you want to look for hidden treasure? Okay, that's an investigation DC 15. Uh, do you want to pick the locked door? That's, a, you know, thieves tool DC 15. Uh, do you want to climb the walls? Uh, to reach a, a very high up, like, uh, dormer window or something like that. That's an Athletics DC 15. <laughs> right? It makes it very easy. It makes it things from the DM side to run things very quickly. Um, rather than trying to create a... Trying to create those DCs on the fly. Which I also have a different system for that I use. Uh, but it's nice to have just sort of one thing you can be like, okay, everything's 15. And even within that system, with Rune Hammer and ICRPG, it's not always 15. <laughs> I should clarify that. So I believe... Um, I'm looking off to the side because that's where the book is, but I'm not going to grab it. Um, I believe it's you. it says to modify things by a plus 3 or a minus 3. Depending on whether this is a hard task or an easy task. So you might say that uh, searching for hidden treasure is difficult. So you're like, okay, instead of DC 15, it's DC 18. Oh, but um, climbing the walls is is really easy. Maybe they're, they've got a bunch of the, the stones of the wall aren't dressed, so there's a lot of very easy handles or something like that. So you're like, oh, it's just a DC 12 athletics check to reach up there, or it's not very high or whatever you whatever the circumstances, to still give you a little bit of wiggle room for DCs without meaning that you have to come up with every individual DC off the top of your head. Let's see, so next we had talk about the Dungeon Chamber contest. So this is, um, so these are the things that show up actually in each of the chambers. This is the stocking portion. So in this, uh, I use, this is a Basically, a fork of the old basic D&D Moldvay dungeon stocking is very similar that uses a D6 to stock. Um, and it's, look, the room is either empty, it has some sort of hazard, obstacle, trick, or trap, right? The, depending on the condition of our dungeon, it's going to determine which of those it is. And it may contain a creature, or creatures, multiple. Uh, so basically we roll 2d6 and we combine it. So let's say I rolled a 2 and a 6. Alright, so it would be empty and a creature. So the room has a creature in it. So you might say, well, why empty? Well, empty rooms are important from a design perspective because it gives... It gives space in between encounters, which is very helpful. There's a lot of... I don't want to get too in, in the weeds of why to incorporate empty rooms with it. But why it's specifically on this list is because when you roll duplicate results, that also means that there's treasure in the room. So, if you rolled a 6 and a 2, that would mean that the room only has a creature or a creature encounter in it. But if you rolled a 6 and a 5, that means the room only has a creature encounter in it. But it also has treasure in it. Um, and we want to keep that clear because the treasure may or may not be overt. It may be hidden somewhere. So we want I don't want to tip my hand for players when I'm stalking the dungeon. Be like, oh, because there wasn't a creature and something else in it, that means there's treasure in here. No. And it could just have the creature in there. That's why the empty the empty placeholders are here in in this d6 roll table 
So, right, basically you can have an empty room with a hazard obstacle trigger trap in it. You can have an empty room with a creature in it. You can have an empty room by itself, uh, which means that it's probably going to have a treasure in it. Not necessarily, but maybe. Um, which is one of the things that we have in here. Right, because if you roll a 1 and a 2, then, right, you're not going to have a treasure in it. But if you roll two ones, you're going to have a treasure in there. So, that helps it, like, every time that your, your party in-game runs across an empty room, they don't immediately know that there's treasure in there. But it also gives them the idea that they should probably be searching most rooms for treasure. At least at a cursory glance, because that's probably why they're in the dungeon to begin with, is to get treasure out of it. Um, and it also gives me an or organic place to put treasure for the dungeon into the dungeon, right? I know which rooms to put it into. Uh, so here we talk about just hazards and obstacles really quick, because we don't really need to talk about empty rooms. Empty rooms are empty rooms. Uh, so hazards and opt obstacles represent non-combat exploration-based challenges for your players. So we have a couple different examples down here. Uh, we have, you know, chasms, lakes and pools, rivers, like underground waters, flooded chambers, uh, spell effect zones, fungus, mold, ooh, slimes, uh, creatures or things that serve as alarms. Uh, one of my favorites is shriekers, which is a little type of fungus. It's a, it's a mushroom, I think. And if you come within so many feet of it, it basically goes off like a steam whistle, which will serve as basically a natural alarm trap for people in the dungeon. So if, you're, if your players aren't paying attention and you describe these mushrooms and they decide to walk right next to the mushrooms or come up and inspect it, it's going to go off and then right, we roll for wandering monsters at that time. Uh, and if they're if they were, you know, being quiet and being hidden and stealthing sort of through the passageways, they're going to lose a lot of that stealth because people are going to be like, oh, well, somebody set off the mushrooms, set off the alarm. Uh, so probably somebody who's not supposed to be in here is in the dungeon and we should go investigate. Uh, all other sorts of stuff like flora that might have sort of conditions or damage that it does. Uh, if you want to do, like, sort of lotus flower uh, eaters where, you know, maybe maybe you have some sort of flora that has the potential to put people to sleep or something like that. Uh, some sort of trivial monster swarm. Uh, wild magic surges. These are all the sort of things, right, that represent hazards and obstacles and things that usually kind of show the dungeon kind of breaking down because it's probably not in the greatest repair. That's why we end up with a bunch of these hazards and obstacles. Right? Falling debris, things of that nature. Uh, some sort of barrier or impassable terrain that probably isn't supposed to be there. Right? Might be some sort of cave-in or something like that. Uh, yeah, and then I talk about, you know, making more... If you want to make more unique hazards, because, right, these are pretty generic... Uh, a good thing to do is to roll two, roll two d20s and then combine the results. Uh, so 13 and 16, which is disease and vermin or trivial monster swarm. All right, I talk about, well, if you want to make a rat swarm, that also their bite has a similar effect to the paralysis effect of a ghoul's claw attack. So if you have this rat swarm that by itself is not, right, the rat swarm is like a quarter CR monster i think so i mean like any anybody who's like second level or above is probably not going to have any problem with a rat swarm but if it also does paralysis that could be a problem <laughs> and it's weird and it's different it'll be a memorable much more memorable encounter for your players uh, so those are the hazards and obstacles and i actually i think i have another list that I may use to update this one, where I think I combine some of the things like Liquid Lake and Pool together to have a little bit more variety. So I may update this later. 
I'll have to dig out the other document, which I'm not going to do right now. Uh, since we're almost two hours into the stream, I'm, I'm definitely not going to do it right now. But I think that'll get... I'll at least get us up to basically where I'm working right now, uh, which we're getting pretty close. Uh, actually, we're, we're almost right there. Uh, and then I'll stop the stream for today, and then, you know, maybe I'll come back to, to this later after I do a little bit more work on it and showcase some of the other changes I've made to it, which would be a lot of fun. And then, or maybe I'll work with uh, people who are watching and see if you guys have any have any suggestions or things you'd like to see or things we could add to it or change things up because right now this pretty much represents only the only my mind uh and it could be definitely a thing where if we crowdsource it we can get some better stuff in here um than just my own thoughts because I'm, I'm far from the perfect dm in the world <laughs> and so my ideas are okay i think i think they're okay <laughs> You know, there, there are people that have different perspectives and think about things differently than I do, and those would be, it's helpful to have different viewpoints and things like this. Um, because one of the things that's useful for, right, the entire reason you're using the document is to keep you from basically repeating making the same dungeon again and again and again. So having other people's input in what goes into those tables and the randomizers will help make sure that that does not happen because they come from a different perspective um so in addition right we had we talked about our hazards and obstacles there's also tricks and traps so tricks and traps they use these first four right here uh so the basic well let me step back the, the biggest difference is that tricks and traps are intentional right Somebody has put them in the dungeon specifically to deal with either, depending on the effects of those tricks or traps, deal with the people who live there, the people who are supposed to be there. If it's a trick, there are tricks sometimes that have good effects. Uh, so there's a reason why it's there and people are using The creators put it, put it there and why it's being used. Um, or they're to discourage or really screw with you know, people who are trespassing, people who are coming into this area that aren't supposed to be here. Um, and there are basically four major types of traps, and that's what takes up the first 12 of the 20. There's an alarm trap, which works very much like the, the shrieker mushrooms we were just talking about. Its entire point is to alert the defenders that somebody's here. Um, there is the detainment trap, which basically imprisons intruders. That's like a, a pit trap, something like that, like a tiger tiger pit. The idea is to basically capture them so that um, the people, the guards in the area can find them and deal with them before, the, before they uh, run amok in your dungeon. The third one is a lockdown trap, which locks the exits to prevent ingress and egress. Uh, basically coming in or out of the dungeon. While you could see these in some sort of complexes or natural structures, I feel like they show up most in vaults. Right? It's when somebody hits the the alarm in the prison and the sirens start to go off and all the doors shut, right? Uh, so it keeps people from coming in or out. Um, which is very useful if from both sides, whether this is a haven or a prison, right? I feel like, oh, we, we're protecting this magical artifact in here. And somebody, adventurers come in, so basically robbers come in to take that thing, and that's the thing you're trying to protect. It, like, immediately locks it down so they can't get out. And then the last type is the most common trap type, at least in D&D, which is just... It's a trap that's meant to kill people. So one of the things that I do a little bit different than I think most people do, or most people design traps with, uh, is that if a trap is meant to hurt someone, then that the tr the trap the intent of the trap is to kill the person. So it needs to do damage that would kill a person. 
So I really dislike, especially D&D traps that are like, oh, well it only does a D8 of damage. Well, a D D8 of damage isn't necessarily going to kill even a commoner, <laughs> depending on what you roll. So that's not a very good murder trap. You want, like, a tripwire attached to, like, a sawed-off shotgun. That's what you want. It's just going to shoot somebody in the face. Right? You want to make sure they die. That's the whole point. Uh, so you want to make sure that the traps are lethal in that way. So I have a whole thing about improvised damage. Um, I have it on my resources on a Pay One True One on Drive Through RPG. if you guys are interested in getting that. Um, I'm also doing a follow-up blog that I'm putting together on my... Oh, I don't have it with me. I put it in my game bag for yesterday. Um, my Dungeon Master binder that I've put together talks about improvising damage uh, because I don't like the tables that they use in, in 5e Raw uh, because I think they're really difficult and you have to reference them. So instead I use... I came up with an algorithm that basically pumps out the same amount of damage at every level, uh, but doesn't require a chart. It's, <laughs> I, you could just memorize it if you want. Uh, which is uh, a number of... So if it's a... I can just talk about it really quick. If it's an area of attack or a multi-target, um, some sort of hazard, trap, or whatever, it does a number of D6 in damage equal to the party's level, plus that much, plus their level as a modifier. So if it's a 5th level party that sets off, you know, a fireball trap, instead of doing the fireball damage, it does 5d6 damage, plus 5 to each of those characters. Um, and if it targets only one character, it does a d10 instead of a d6. Uh, the reason that's different is because if we hit, if we hit a fireball trap that hit the entire party with 5d10 plus 5 damage, the likelihood that it's that it's gonna knock half the party out or more is really, really high, <laughs> which is not necessarily what we want. Um, we just want it to feel like it's trying to murder them, not necessarily actually murder everyone in the party. <laughs> uh, so we use D6s, so that's going, it's gonna take a major chunk out of, if uh, most classes have a D8 hit die, so if people are at max and they have some amount of con modifier, the likelihood that a D6 plus um, trap is going to just n take them from full HP to zero is almost impossible. It can still happen. It can still happen if you're using, like, rolled HP as opposed to taking the modifier, but it's highly unlikely. Um, but if, there are, if you have an entire party at half health and everybody fails... Uh, well, the likelihood that, you know, it's going to knock out a big chunk of the party is pretty good, which is going to make it feel really de deadly, but also it's not enough damage that is going to hit that hit point maximum in the negative to just outright kill people. Uh, unless you had a wizard, a d6 hit point wizard with like 3 HP, it's a 5th level wizard running around with 3 HP and just gets nuked by this trap. Uh, maybe <laughs> they could die. It's still unlikely, but they could just get smoked. But uh, don't don't walk don't walk around with three HP. And that's what you do, right? You're like, hey, we need to take a rest or take a healing potion or get the cleric to cast a spell or something. Like you, as a fifth level character, you shouldn't be walking around with three HP, especially as a wizard with crappy AC and not the greatest saves in the world. Um, so that's what I what I want with the murder murder traps is that I want them to feel like they are actively trying to kill people rather than just kind of like you know taking pot shots at them and just like oh I'm just gonna carve off like 10 HP <laughs> which a lot of 5e traps feel like they're they're created or designed more to be an annoyance than actually killing characters which is what they're meant to do. Uh, the rest of these, 13 through 20, are tricks, for the most part. Uh, so they, they deal, they're tricks, as in that they screw with characters in different types of ways. Uh, right, 
a resource eater trick will eat hit points or hit dice or spell slots or uh, eats their gold, <laughs> eats valuables from them. Uh, armor trick that does some sort of damage to their ability scores or does really debilitating conditions like blindness or deafness gives them exhaustion levels or gives them maybe some sort of like permanent poison condition for, for an amount of time. Uh, an anti-magic field that's a really nasty one if you have a if you have a decent sized um, party or a decent size decent leveled party you know that's sort of in those mid levels and then you throw a, a decent combat at them in the middle of an anti-magic zone they're gonna have a real rough time that like kind of bog standard combat is suddenly going to be way more difficult when your paladin can't use smite uh, when their magic weapons don't use work when their bag of holding no longer works and their you know spells don't work you can't use spells uh, any of those sort of like buff spells you had on it immediately get knocked off as soon as they walk into the room right it can make make things really really difficult um, so that's a real nasty trick to put on some, put on uh, a group, especially in addition to something else that's going on. Like if you wanted to do, if you wanted to double up and do like, it's maybe this has two tricks, right? Where it's like, oh well, you know, it's a anti magic and it's a trap where the room fills with water or something like that. Well, all those people that were in sort of like have something cool like mariner's armor or cast off armor that makes it much easier to like swim around while well, suddenly those those effects don't work on your armor when you're in the anti-magic zone uh so now you have your your plate wearing fighter just stuck at the bottom of this room as the water is races above their head because there's no way they're going to be able to swim with you know 50 plus pounds of armor on in addition to another 50 pounds of gear on their back, right? It's just not going to happen. Uh, which can put them in a very difficult situation. If, especially if you're in the dungeon and, you know, the wizard wasn't like, oh yeah, I definitely prepared water breathing today for a dungeon crawl. Um, after that we have object animator trick. That's just a fun one. It's a fun, goofy one. If uh, the PC, if items in the room animate or the PC's gear animate and start attacking them. That's always a, a fun thing and it, it definitely definitely it's a fun way um, to set up to use like the PC's advantages against them. Which can be fun. Uh, and an awaken or summon monster trick, right? Those are always fun. Uh, you can turn the, the sort of uh, druids summon a whole bunch of fairies or summon a whole bunch of pixies you can turn it on its head and be like oh well this room summons a whole bunch of pixies to cast a whole bunch of high level spells against you uh, a mind altering magic trick anything that does like charm effects or cause fear confusion suggestion yeast modify memory modify memory would be a really screwy one uh, if you kept walking into a room and er erased your memory of that room Uh, that, that would be a very fun, very difficult dungeon to get through. <laughs> I can see that, that really grinding progress in the dungeon to a halt if you weren't paying attention. Uh, a teleportation trick, right? Very standard, right? The Tomb of Horrors has a really classic one where you go into the teleportation and it takes all your stuff and <laughs> spits you back out at the beginning of the dungeon without your things. Um, there's a bunch of, actually there's a number of teleporter tricks uh, so they can be fun very very different so my, my feeling about tricks for d, d in general is that tricks are very much an old school D&D feel um, with a lot of times they're just kind of it's unlike like tricks by their definition aren't necessarily meant to kill people um, it's basically just to kind of screw with them, right? They're tricks. They're just kind of mean-spirited pranks a lot of the time. Um, and these, so the tricks that I have listed here are all negative ones, but there are definitely positive tricks where you have, like, pools of water that, you know, 
fill up your hit points or give you inspiration or something like that that you can create. But these are primarily because we're filling these rooms out with challenges. Uh, so these are meant to be things that the players need to overcome. Uh, and then the last one is a control panel trick. Um, so if you've ever played, like, these are very spatial puzzles. Kind of thing. So if you've ever played, like, a Legend of Zelda, the classic Legend of Zelda game, they have a lot of those where it's like, oh, you need to flip a switch and go here and do a thing. Um, because it does things like, oh, there's a big red button. Well, if you put a big red button in the room, the players are probably going to press the big red button. So if that big red button <laughs> reactivates all the traps that they've... <laughs> <laughs> you've um, disarmed it could be really fun <laughs> because they don't know what it does because maybe they can't read the language that's written on it and they don't take the time to they just want to see what happens um, yeah or the, <laughs> the self-destruct or sterilize facility button um, that's, that's kind of a, a trophy sci-fi one for the most part or, you know, you, you hit the button either on purpose or accident, and the, the place is going to self-destruct. And you're like, oh, we got to get out of the dungeon. <laughs> and whether, you, whether you're done with the dungeon or not, you're going to have to get out of it because it's going to explode or do something. But if you were doing that, it would be fun to do the control panel trick. But if you were doing it in, let's say, one, one of these... A dungeon condition in which the trick or trap is not functioning the way that it's supposed to. So if it counts down all the way to zero and then nothing happens, and your players are just standing outside the dungeon, <laughs> waiting for it to explode or do something, and it doesn't do that. Um, another fun thing is that, like, if you were doing that self destruct thing, like, if there are people, right, if there are other factions in the dungeon, they're also gonna not wanna die in the dungeon. And so then you can have the party and monsters all running out of the dungeon at the same time, which could be, um, while very, very funny, could also turn out very, very poorly if you end up just basically trading together, you know, five or six different monster combat encounters as everybody exits the dungeon at the same time. Um, and that's, that's, that's basically the end. I haven't gotten quite to do the, the refreshing the creature encounters, but I do have that information um, down here. So we can look at it real quick because we talked about the seven creature encounters before. So we'll go over this real quick and then I'll probably go ahead and uh, end the stream. Yeah, we've been going for about two hours now, so that's probably a pretty good place to end it. So, But we can talk about sort of the monster encounter setup real quick. So the idea is that I kind of use a 4-2-1 sort of approach because I found that this was really helpful um, to, to sort of vary the types of monster encounters or creature encounters. So when you're rolling for room contents and you're like, okay, that's a, that's a normal monster encounter. That's a normal monster encounter. Okay, so that's two normals. So then there's a special monster encounter. Then there's two more normals then a special, then a boss, and you just kind of repeat those encounters. So that way there's always going to be more of the generic monster encounters, and then there's going to be ha about half as many special monsters, and then half as many boss monsters to special monsters. And then down here it kind of talks about... Um, so normal monsters are, are the setup that we use for stocking chambers and what we use for the wandering monsters table that we sort of create at the end of this. Uh, and we could talk on a different stream about why I like wandering monsters. I didn't used to. I didn't used to ever use them. Um, and then I had it, the purpose of wandering monsters appropriately explained to me. And then, you know, it was like a light switch. I was like, oh, I get them now. These aren't just throwaway encounters. They serve a purpose when they're when they're used the way they're supposed to be used. They're not supposed to be throwaway encounters. They're supposed to be things that push the party in a certain way. That are sort of like a metagaming tool for DMs to be like, if you want to do this thing, there there's risk associated with it, and that risk is wandering monsters. It's not just a random thing that happens all the time. 
Um, it's supposed to ramp. Like I said, we'll, we can talk about it in a totally different stream. Go over it. Uh, but right now, so the normal monster is right, and these use a, a pyramid set up for for d6, which is one of the things I like to do. So it's a weighted roll table, where 50% of the time it's going to be a trivial encounter, a third of the time it's going to be an easy encounter, and one sixth of the time it's going to be a harder encounter. So a trivial encounter is something that's significantly um, below uh, the, the party's level. Uh, which can be a little bit difficult to do if you have a, a level 1 party. Uh, that pretty much means that you're going to be making 0 level encounters that are way below. They may come across like one zero level creature. Um, and these are just the CRs that we use. So it doesn't necessarily, again, doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a combat encounter. It's just the the difficulty or the CR of the creatures that are involved in this. Uh, so, right, trivial is far, far below. It should be an easy thing. This is the sort of thing where you, you know, a level four party rocks up on on some goblins and they're just like, yeah, we use basic attacks and cantrips to kill them. No big deal. It's just a thing that we do. We just do the math. That's what we call um, a cupcake encounter. It's a very easy one. It makes players feel really good because they just get to roll over some bad guys and just, like, show how powerful they are which is always good. You want to mix the, the challenge range, the variety of the difficulty in in your dungeons and your adventures in general to make sure that there are times where, you know, your players get to feel great and have fun just curb stomping bad guys. Um, and then there are harder <laughs> encounters that will do the same to them. Um, after that is easy. So basically minus one party level so if you had that fourth level party you'd you'd make you'd balance the encounter as if they were third level and so they're still more powerful than the idea is that um, most of these will use very little if any resources from them but they also use very dynamic encounters which means that most of the time my monsters don't fight to the death most of the time they're going to run away um, whenever they reach half health or half the half of their side, their group of the party, their group of, in the encounter is dead. So if you had like six goblins, they would run away either when that goblin reaches half hit points, or there were only three goblins left, and now they're outnumbered, and now they're, they want to get the heck out of there. Um, the idea, the tension is, is that they're going to try to run away and get reinforcements, right? Now that they know that you're in the dungeon, they're going to go tell everybody you're in the dungeon. Uh, so the the point of combat changes from kill monsters to stop the monsters from telling other monsters that we're here. And so it's just a different function. Or they may surrender, right? If they feel like they can't get out, they may surrender. And just... It's up to... the the party and your players, depending on your players, whether your parties are cold-blooded and they just will just outright execute creatures, um, or they take them as prisoners or hostages and they're like, okay, but what do we do? Do we just carry these goblins around with us in a train? Like, what if we're still... Like, they could, they could flag anybody down, they could just start screaming and alert people, they could try to run away. It's a mess, but that's, that's the player's mess to deal with. Not yours as a DM. Uh, so the special monsters don't show up on the wandering monster chart. Um, they they only show up in chambers, and they are they start off right at party level, and they go harder from there, right to to hard, and then deadly encounters. And then I don't have one for both monsters, but then right you know, you're either making a, a solo encounter at that point, or you're making a bit usually a quite difficult combat encounter that's going to be on par probably with one of these specials and also introduces um, um, the idea that I use so we talked about a cupcake encounter but I also use another term that I call um, hammer encounters which is basically the most difficult combat or at least it's planned to be the most difficult combat in the dungeon 
and I typically try not to make that the actual boss of the dungeon. Because if you've played d and long enough, or you've run d and long enough, you know that d and by itself is it's a game of resource management, right? It's about hip, keeping your hit points and your spell slots and knowing when to use them correctly for the maximum amount of effect and not leaving yourself vulnerable. So what that typically means in, so, in an adventure or any dungeon crawl, and I'm sure you've probably experienced this from either side of the DM screen, is that players will save up those big spells whenever possible so they can just unload on the boss monster in a dungeon. Right, you save all those resources and then you go Nova and you try to kill the, the big boss monster as fast as you can. Well, if you do that, right, because the way that I use the hammer counter in it not being the big bad guy, if they waste all those spells on the big bad guy, that hammer encounter can still be out there if they haven't dealt with it yet. And so, they may be like, oh, we got all the big treasure and got all our stuff out. Oh, we still have some other areas of the dungeon we haven't explored yet. Let's go ahead and do that before we head out of here, because this is what, never going to come back. And then they, you know gleefully trundle into the most difficult encounter in the dungeon and they've got very few resources because they, they wasted them all on the boss monster um, and then they you know they can be sent kicking and screaming uh, to the mat or right you, you could end up with a TPK if you're not careful right uh, but it could also like really take them from a very high emotional high to a very emotional low very quickly um, when they realize that there is something worse in this dungeon than what was the boss, uh, which could be a lot of fun, uh, or the reverse works, right? Uh, they will they will come across the hammer encounter first, and if they're smart, they're going to waste all those. They're going to use m the majority of the resources on that fight. Um, but if they if they decide to slug it out because they know this isn't the boss. They decide to slug it out and they're going to use a whole bunch of healing spells and they're going to use all their healing potions and you know because they're trying to keep spell slots and abilities for the boss because they're like obviously the boss has to be more difficult than this encounter and so they slug it out um, and then they get to go into the boss and fight uh, either having used a whole bunch of resources which makes the boss fight which maybe was a difficult fight but not the most difficult but because they have less resources, like the scales shift, and that boss fight actually becomes harder than it, than it is on paper because they don't have all the resources. Or, um, they didn't use those resources and they get to feel really, really cool because they, they were able to scrape by that really, really difficult fight. Now they can still unload on the big bad, on the boss of the guy, on the boss of the dungeon, and feel, feel great. And then they can have those highs and those moments and then they don't have to work and explore the rest of the dungeon they haven't done yet and still feel great. Um, it makes, for me, that hammer, using the cupcake encounters and the hammer encounters uh, makes the dungeon more unpredictable, which is what I want. Uh, I wanted the dungeon to feel like it could always be dangerous. If you kill the boss, the dungeon's still dangerous. <laughs> uh, if you, if you, fight that hammer encounter and you, that's not the boss so you're like the dungeon is still dangerous and it's more dangerous now uh but that's that's sort of where we are and i think that's where i'm going to end the stream now so let's just go ahead and hop back over here just chatting window okay yeah so that was everything uh we got accomplished everything i was trying to get accomplished um i'm going to keep working on this document uh, I put a, good, a lot of good work into it. I think, I don't know if I'll finish it this weekend, but I'll get it done in the not-too-distant future. Um, and if you guys are interested in, in seeing that and getting it, uh, I may convert it to a... This is pretty much just for my own edification, but I would I would definitely consider putting this on drive through RPG for other people to use if people are interested in that. Uh, the best way to do that is to let me know in chat, to give me follows, to reach out to me on Twitter. You can run over to my blog where it has a lot of similar things if you liked what was here. Uh, I've got years and years of stuff backed up there that you can take a look at. 
Uh, you can see my other things that are on pay what, my other pay what you want titles on Drive Through RPG. Uh, all those links are in the profile on my Twitch profile, so you can just go check those out. Um, and I think that's it. I don't, is there anything else? Let me make sure I'm not missing something. Anything that I'm forgetting. <laughs> hmm. So like I said, um, the first part of the stream was prep for tomorrow's stream. I'm actually going to build the character for that solo RPG experience. So if you're interested in doing solo RPGs and want to know how that works and how uh, I run it as sort of a weird sort of hex crawl thing and using making 5th edition uh, work as a solo RPG... Make sure to come back tomorrow and check that out. It should be down in the schedule. Uh, I'm still clearing up, cleaning up the schedule. The scheduling on Twitch is a little bit weird for content. Because uh, it keeps wanting to re repeat streams rather than just let me put individual stream titles for different things. But I'm definitely streaming tomorrow. so And that's it's the correct time that's in there. So if you want to come back and see that, jump back on tomorrow. Or, of course, you can follow me and then you'll get the notifications that I'm going live. But that's it for right now. So uh, thanks thanks for coming along. Thanks for rocking with me as I get things prepared for tomorrow and going forward. I uh, really enjoyed this. It was a lot of fun. And I will see you guys next time. All right. Bye.